My name is Dr. Ruth Kerr Jacoby, J-A-K-O-B-Y. I was born September 2nd, 1929. I'm 75 years old. On September 2nd, I will be 76. My I mean, 86, sorry. My birthday is September 5th, so we're, we can oh. both be Virgos together. Uh, <laughs> um, and, so, and where were you born? Palo Alto, California. And uh, just, um, and, and you said you were, uh, you have a doctorate. What, what's your field then? Neurosurgery. Oh, wow. I received my uh, MD at uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons, Columbia University, New York City. And, and what year? In 1953. Wow, that's amazing. I practiced for 17 years in Washington, neurosurgery. Associate clinical professor at George Washington University Hospital at a private practice. Uh, then I turned in my private practice and I became chief of spinal cord injury at the VA hospital in Houston, Texas. So you wonder what I'm doing here? <laughs> I'm wondering what you're doing here and uh, uh, Alex said that your father was involved with the Manhattan Project. And I just, if yes. you could just um, so you're, you were born in 1929, you said? That's so, right. I was about 14 or 15. Yeah. Um, my father was professor of geology, mineralogy, at Columbia University. He had an office in Scaramahon Hall. He was there for over 40 years, and uh, he was head of the department. Now, in the 40s, he, uh, under his office at Scaramahon Hall, Hall, Columbia University, there was a the basement and there was a spiral staircase from his office down to the basement. And as a child, I used to like to play on that spiral staircase. One day, though, it was forbidden. I could no longer have anything to do with that staircase or go down in the basement or anything. And I later found out that was because Fermi and Yuri, I guess it was mostly Yuri at that time, Fermi, Oppenheimer, they, they were all together at one time, they visited at least at Columbia. And down there, they actually built the first atomic pile. It wasn't complete, they just started it. My father was not concerned about what they were doing there. He was concerned of the hydrogen tanks. He was afraid they'd burn, explode. But this was only temporary. Then they all left. I guess they went to Chicago. And you probably know the story better than I from that time on. At one time, they were even thinking of putting it in Yankee Stadium. But they didn't, fortunately. Can you imagine what that would have caused in New York City? But Los Alamos, they, they were the ones that got it. So all I know is that uh, they were doing something down there. The FBI was present. One time I met a couple of people in the FBI. And on the street, I was always told by my father, don't ever sign anything, don't. But there were people always trying to get you to sign something. And uh, my sister later found out about this. She was younger than I. And she was interested in physics. And she went in to physics at Stanford, got her master's and then worked at uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. And she did some of that underground uh, testing when they tested the, uh, collecting the um, radiation experiments. I don't know what she did exactly, but something. She was one of the first women allowed in the mine. They didn't like people, women. It was sort of, um, Miners were worried about women being there. How many siblings did you have? How many what? Siblings. Oh, just my sister. And can you say your father's name one more time, just to make sure we have it on the tape? I'm your, sorry. Your father's name? Can you say it one more but time? Paul Francis, F-R-A-N-C-I-S is the male. And C-E-S is female. C-I-S, Kerr, K-E-R-R. -R. And so, so you were 14 or so, uh, mm -hmm. World War II, you're in New York, um, and 
other than this basement question, did you have any idea what was going on uh, at Columbia? No, I had no idea that they were building a bomb. No, he, it was as though he really didn't believe in these physicists very much himself. He thought they were pretty far left and this was not going to work, whatever it was. Uh, I just didn't have a very good impression from my father of these physicists. And, uh, so it, uh, he went along with it. They could do what they wanted underneath his office. It was hidden, you know, he'd just go down. Nobody could just access it very easily. They'd have to go down that staircase to his office. I don't know if the elevator had any opening down there. So, and oh, cool. the interesting thing, though, this sort of has followed me. In Barnard College in '50, the Rosenberg trial came up. And there was a lot of feeling among the Barnard students that this was not right, that, that uh, Ethel should not be killed. And, um, but since I was interested in medicine, they said, oh, don't, don't get her involved with anything like this. She's going to medical school. So, so uh, the others people were the activists for that day and age. They didn't call them activists, but, um, but I was sort of interested in Ethel Rosenberg. I guess she was the second woman ever killed for being a traitor. And then, after practicing a number of years and everything, and being at the BA, I got interested more from the veterans that I took care of there and the problems. It's a long story. I got interested, though, in the law, in health law. And so I got a JD, and uh, one of the first um, ABA meetings that I went to, they had this mock trial of Ethel and uh, Rosenberg. I was very impressed with this trial. Um, they had all the evidence and they put it on like it was the actual thing. They had only six people who were going to be the jurors. And over that time, the interests of people had changed. At that time, when they were killed, Ethel, executed. There was a great fear of the atomic bomb. People were afraid that Russia would get it and there was a lot of animosity. Now, much later, with this mock trial, the jurors, uh, just picked ordinary people, were not that uh, afraid of it. And actually, a part, it was a partly hung jury about Ethel. They didn't think necessarily there was enough evidence mm -hmm. to kill her. Just something about the typewriter, as I recall, that she had access to. And they thought the defendant's lawyer, perhaps, was not as good as he could have been as far as um, eliminating some of this evidence. And there wasn't enough, really, to convict her. That was sort of the theory. And they had it all computerized so that the jury, if they were impressed with the evidence, they could um, show it and you'd have a graph. And to me, who just finished law school, it was very interesting about how a jury reacts and how to select a jury and all of that. But even more so than that was the fact that um, when Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were executed. They had two twelve, a 12 year old son and a younger one. And it always occurred to me how awful this could be for a young boy to lose both his parents. Well, much later, uh, I guess this was around 90, 1990. So, say, say 50 to 90, at least 40 years later, maybe more. 
these boys would be grown up. And one of them was there at the trial. <laughs> and he was asked, because uh, he could see that perhaps this lawyer that had his father's and mother defense uh, didn't do quite a top-notch job. And uh, somebody was talking to him, asked, so, you know, sort of how he felt about this. And he said he did not care. The lawyer did his best, and the lawyer saved his life. These sons evidently were taken care of by this lawyer, given them a different name, sent them wherever to grow up so that he could become a professor at one of the Northeastern schools, have a normal, more or less normal life. I mean, I thought this would make a real story how a young boy could face that. And at a knowledgeable age, he was 12, and could grow up and, and be a good citizen, ostensibly. I don't really know all the facts. I just saw him and maybe said a few words to him, but nothing very personal, except for somebody who asked about it. He said that lawyer saved his life. So somehow that lawyer did a great job with the sons. He may have missed one or two things, that, but he probably couldn't have changed the outcome of the trial anyway. And I think, uh, I think the son realized that and respected the lawyer for all he had done for the two children. So it's funny how as you grow up, a thing keeps close to you, you hear about it. And so I was very interested in this meeting when it came up. And uh, I don't know if uh, the two sons uh, knew about this meeting or the people at this meeting know about the two sons or, or what. Only one of them was uh, at this ABA meeting. I've met one of them once. Oh, you've uh, met one of them? When I was uh, an undergraduate, he came and gave a talk. Uh, he was a professor where you were? No, he was, I think, just visiting. Uh, Mirapol is the last name that they took from the lawyer. And, and he, he seemed? Coincidentally, the lawyer, Mirapol, adopted him. He, he wrote the song on Strange Fruit, the Billie Holiday song about uh, lynching. So Very it was a small world. Small world, um, isn't it? So I wanted to just ask, um, so do you know anything else about what your father was doing during World War II? Yes, um, he uh, had Q clearance, mm -hmm. top clearance, and they sent him to Africa to look for uranium. Mm -hmm. And he found an old mine there which formerly, it was closed then, but had formerly uranium. And he examined it and decided that that would be a good place to get the uranium. So the mine was reopened. I was young then. I don't know exactly where in Africa it was. I just know that the family was very worried about this. My mother was pretty frantic. They had an insurance policy on him, $10,000 in those days. <laughs> nothing for these days but uh, they were my mother was extremely anxious about his going to Africa and I think you know, the story is that there was some general who wanted to get on the plane but he was displaced by this Q clearance civilian <laughs> and couldn't understand that do you know how long approximately he was gone do you remember Less than a month. Okay. I don't know the exact amount. And did he ever tell you much about this when, after years he later? He brought me back an ivory bracelet of a snake. <laughs> you can't have ivory nowadays. But, and he some bands from an elephant tusk. You know. And, uh, oh, I guess some carved objects, too. But he never talked to me about the mine or what he found there. But I made many field trips with him later before he died, after my mother died. Uh, he was alone 
And uh, so I took some geology courses and took field trips. And where I'd gone with the professors, I'd take him if he hadn't been there, or even if he'd been there, show him what, what uh, we found. And it was a wonderful experience, really. Do you remember him saying anything after the atomic bombs were used or announced any opinion? Well, I know he worked for the Atomic Energy mm -hmm. Commission, AEC. Mm -hmm. um, we knew about the bomb and everything, pros and cons, of ending the war, killing all these people, civilians and all that. But um, I don't think I talked to him much about that. Uh, his, his was just finding the uranium. He didn't, uh, and he really thought they wouldn't succeed. He didn't believe in it. Oh, they're doing something. It's, it's one of these, the story of them finding the uranium is one of these stories that was not talked about very much after they used the bomb because it was still secret. Uh, and it was secret for a long time, in part, and I don't know if your father knew about this, but what the army wanted to do was to locate all the sources of uranium in well, the world. Well, that's right. Well, he did find it in the United States. Mm -hmm. Later on, they found deposits, and in Canada. So I think he probably helped them find all that. He, although he was a professor during the academic year, every summer he did these field works for mining companies and uh, we would go out west and I would stay with my grandmother as a child and uh, my sister, we'd both be in my grandmother's home and he would be working. We wouldn't see him all summer long, he would be doing field work. With his graduate students, he, I don't know, but very, in quite a few 40 some odd PhDs he helped. And he found a job for all of his students, which they don't always do now, but he made sure that they definitely every student don't. <laughs> got a job. <laughs> so, so, but I, we never talked about that. Now, the last three years of his life, he did have angina pectoris, you know, he mm -hmm. would get pain in his chest and down his arm if he overexerted. So we drove around to all these mines and fields, anywhere the car could go, that was fine. And then he'd walk around and, you know, pick up ore bodies, but no real going up the mountains or anything. But we did do that. and. Uh, at that time, I was interested in geology and mining the last three years, and so I picked up some mining claims, patented mining claims, and uh, this was a copper mine, a copper chief mine, and I uh, got the deed to it, and I decided I'd find out what this mine was all about. So I took each of my professors at ASU, Arizona State University, down on the weekends. They came down. One was a geophysicist, Dr. Salk, and then Dr. Burt was a mineralogist. He went down, and we explored this mine. And Dr. Salk was the first one, and as we went south of Tucson, it was in Arizona, it says, do not enter Uniproving ground. And uh, Dr. Salk thought, well, you know, our geologists, they explore these areas and they have you know, written their PhDs on the geology here. There's no problem. So we went down to the mine. It was on the Yuma Proving Ground, which is an active army base where they explode things and bomb things and all that stuff. But it was close to I-10 and it was sort of in a buffer zone and they would never do anything that close to a major highway. So I conferred with the Army about this. 
And I said, you have my mind. You are, you've taken it. No, we haven't taken it. So we worked out a, a little contract between me and the Army Corps of Engineers. And they would pay me $1,200 a year for the evacuation right. If they needed to evacuate me, I would go away for three weeks, two or three times a year. They did this for several years. And then they stopped. And that was when I had a JD from law school. And uh, so I went to court, Federal Court of Claims, said they had taken it. I should be compensated. Nope. The judge said, no, it is yours. You can go down there and develop the mine, take dynamite to the proving ground. You know. So I have this mine, which I've been trying to develop. And my father went down there, and he had done a lot of work for mining companies, the uh, Silver Bell, which is a mining company that has gone on for many years and has had over a billion dollars worth of copper ore. And he saw the same alteration, the same type of mineralization, and he thought there's a 50-50 chance of there being an equally good deposit down there. So I had thought that that would be a good thing to develop. And that's where I am now. <laughs> so I feel like I'm in suspense. Does it have the deposit or do you know yet? Or are you still working on it? It needs drilling. Okay. <laughs> I have to uh, get it drilled. Several drill holes. A company was interested in doing that. But the contract fell through at the last minute. But I think there'll be other companies that will get to drill. I'm only a partial owner of it. Uh, there's another owner, half owner. I didn't know this when I got the duty, so I found out later. Do you remember when the war ended? Um, no, really, I don't. I was still, you know, young and not that much. Oh, during the war, you know, you had rationing and things like that, I remember. We knitted little squares for blankets. And I was in high school and then college in 46 to 50. Uh, and in medical school, a lot of uh, veterans were in our class, which we didn't really realize that these were veterans or different from the usual college people. No, I can't say I graduated in 46 from high school. That's about a year or so after the war. I was just a young girl. I don't think I, I always wanted to go to medical school. I was interested in that. And uh, I don't think that was, uh, when the war ended, I, I don't think I had that exuberation that you see in Times Square. <laughs>